word of the Lord today reads, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is the Spirit! And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he, meaning Jesus, answered him, and excuse me, uh, and he said, Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, Wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Hallelujah. Would you bow your heads with me another moment, Master, today? Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful visitation of the Holy Ghost we are feeling and experiencing in the house of the Lord today. Oh, God, we thank you, Lord, for the gifts of the Holy Ghost. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us directly. We thank you, God, for letting us know what's going on and what's happening around us. For sometimes, Lord, the confusion and the worry and the fear that comes upon your people in response to circumstances and situations that we do not understand. Lord, it's more than we can bear. But you've declared, oh God, that before anything comes toward us or to us, that you would tell us of it. Hallelujah. You speak to your church. You speak warning. You speak preparation. Master, you let us know what's happening. You let us know what's going on so that our hearts might be steadied and our fear might be abated. Oh God, the word of the Lord must go forth at this hour. And God, I humble myself in your presence. This is an important word for the people of God today. And I need you, as always, to anoint the speaker to touch my feeble lips of clay, to touch my mind, to touch my body, to help me, Lord, to deliver the word of the Lord in a fashion that brings glory and honor to your name. For that is above all else my desire. Touch the ear of every hearer. Lord, there are some who have come upon this message even by accident, and yet they don't know there are no accidents in God. But Lord, you've drawn them to this place at this very moment that they might hear that which you would speak unto your church. Open our ears, our hearts, our minds. Help us to receive, O oh God, from heaven that manna 
that is able to sustain our souls. We ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. The text that I've read to you today, this isn't the first time that the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ have had an experience with Jesus involving boats and tumultuous waters. <laughs> this isn't the first time. They've seen miracles in the past. They've seen Jesus rise up from his slumber to go to the bow of the boat and to make a declaration to the stormy seas, Peace! Be still! Right. And suddenly all was calm and the seas were like glass. There were no more waves, no more white caps. There, there were no more harsh winds. The sun began to break through the clouds and all was well with the world. You see, this isn't the first time the disciples were in distress on the sea and they needed Jesus. The only problem is this time Jesus wasn't on the boat with them. Oh Lord, I need Jesus to be on the boat with me. Hallelujah. That way every time something comes, I can call upon Him to fix it. Um, they didn't call upon Him to fix it the first time. They did what most Christians do. They went to him in a panic and accused him of not caring about them. Am I telling the truth? Yep. I didn't see any one of them disciples run to Jesus and say, Lord, can you still the troubled waters? There's an old song we used to sing in the church. Can you still the troubled waters one more time? Make a mohill out of this mountain in my mind. They didn't go to the Lord and say, Lord, can you still the waters? No. No, like most Christians, they went to Him in a panic with accusation upon their lips. I won't tell you, I've heard Christians, I've been in the car, I've been in the church, I've been in the house, when Christian people said, Lord, don't you even care about me? Uh, got news for you. They're in a lick of faith in that statement whatsoever. When you start accusing the Lord of not caring about you, when you start accusing the Lord, do you know what you're doing? You're making a mockery of the Word of God because Jesus said, casting all your cares upon Him because He cares for you. He is your caretaker. So to tell Him, to say to Him, Lord, you don't care about me, that is a fearful accusation you're bringing against God. And Christians, so-called Christians, do it every day. They bring accusations against the Lord. You don't care about me. You don't care if I die. You don't care if I go bankrupt. You don't care if my marriage ends. You don't care if my relationship is over. You don't care if my heart is broken. You don't care if I can pay my bills. That's not faith talking, folks. That's fear talking. Hello now. That's fear talking. And fear and faith are not even remotely akin one to the other. They're not even remotely similar. Too many believers only see miracles when they run to the Lord in a panic like the disciples did in the ship at sea during the storm. Does God step in when you go to Him with your accusations and your stupid words of fear and panic? Does God step in? A lot of times He has, hasn't He? A lot of times the Lord, thank God for God's grace. Thank God for God's love. Thank God for God's mercy. Thank God the Lord doesn't constantly pick apart our emotions and our feelings. Thank God He doesn't pick us apart every time we run to Him. Even when we run to Him in a panic. Even when we run to Him out of fear and we say something stupid. A lot of times, you know what He does? 
like a loving daddy, he steps in anyway. And he does meet the need. He does come through. He does save that marriage. He does save that relationship. He does save that job. He does provide resources to pay that bill. He does put groceries in the cabinet. Hello now! Right. But then as he did on the ship, he turns and rebukes his disciples for not having faith and not trusting Him and coming to Him. Because I'm going to tell you something, honey. The Word of God said that if you're a child of God, you ought not to despise the chastening of the Lord. You ought not to despise the rebuke of the Lord. I'm going to tell you, God may step in and do something for you, but in the next breath, He may give you a tongue lesson to remind you that is not the way you approach me when you have a need. Hello now. So if you feel the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you, oh, I'm going to tell you, I, you know, I can't speak for other people. The only person in the universe I can talk for is me. Because the only experience that I know that I can draw from is my own. There have been times in this church, years ago, when we would go through really difficult patches financially, remember movie? And I'd get so panicked, I mean, all of a sudden I'd be just screaming and hollering, Oh, God have mercy, Jesus. I'd just be, well, we're just going to have to shut the whole thing down. We're just going to have to turn off the lights. We're just going to have to turn off the cameras. We're just not going to be able to do what we do anymore, remember? Now, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but folks, those of you watching online, I don't want you to think that this preacher is anything short of human because I'm not. I'm as stupid and foolish as anybody else can be at times. And then all of a sudden, brother, what happens? Here comes a check. Not a little check, but a big check. It don't just meet the need. It met the need five times over. And I'm standing there looking like an idiot. And I've turned to Tommy and I've said, well, don't I feel stupid? Haven't I? Yeah. I said, don't I feel the fool? Here I was just yesterday screaming and a-hollering, having a fit. And look what God did today. Thank God, God does not limit His miracles to our approaching Him perfectly every time. Thank God, God doesn't always expect us to come to Him in just exactly a certain way before He'll do anything for us. See, there are a lot of preachers out there who will tell you that's how God is. Or if you don't approach Him right, don't expect Him to do anything for you. No. No, wrong. You're not serving the same Jesus I serve. My Jesus loves me, and furthermore, He understands me. And the Word of God said, He knows my frame. He knows that I'm dust. I'm going to tell you something. The Lord understands what I'm made out of. I'm going to tell you a little secret. God understands your heritage. He understands your DNA better than you do. I come from a family of panickers. Lord Jesus, until my great-grandmother, bless her heart, she could panic at the drop of the hat, and she'd drop a hat just to panic. She was an incredible, wonderful, godly, loving, Holy Ghost-filled Christian lady. But sometimes she could worry about the dumbest things. Grandma would ask me, CJ, that's what they call me. My family called me CJ. Don't any of you out there try calling me CJ, because that ain't going to fly. But my great-grandma would say, CJ... Could you take me, would you mind taking me down to the laundromat on Monday? I want to wash my bedding and stuff, and I don't want to use your grandmother, her daughter's uh, washing machine. She said, I'm, I'm going to take it down to the, dry, uh, the uh, washeteria, and I'm going to wash the bedspread and my sheets, and I'm going to dry them there, and I'll bring them home clean and dry. Because my grandmother had a big family and had a lot of stuff going on. And, you know, and grandma didn't want to tie up the washing machine for all that time. So I said, could you do that for me Monday? I said, okay, grandma, I'll do that for you on Monday. Now, that'd be on Wednesday. Thursday, CJ, do, do you remember, honey, that I asked you if you could take me to the washeteria on Monday? I said, grandma, I remember. I'm going to take you Monday, grandma. Here comes Friday. 
Us, honey, honey, uh, uh, do you remember now that I asked you that, um, you, you, that you could take me to wash the terry on Monday? I said, Grandma, this is the third time you've done reminding me about it. I said, believe me, I remember, I know, I've got it in my head, I'm all ready to go. Saturday, same thing. Sunday, same thing. Monday, I go to the house to pick Grandma up. She's not there. I said, what happened? My grandmother says, or my grandfather said, well, your cousin or your, your aunt or whoever happened to be here uh, drove her down to the washeteria so she could wash her bedding. I'd say, now why in the world did grandma do that? Well, I don't know. She just wanted to wash her bed. See, they didn't know she had made an arrangement. I said, she already asked me if I did. Well, after a couple hours, here comes grandma with her bedspread. And mother, you know what I'm talking about. You know how grandma was. She'd come walking in with that bedspread. I'd say, Grandma, you asked me Wednesday if I would take you. You reminded me on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I came today just exactly as I promised I would. Well, I was afraid maybe you'd forgotten. When I tell you that worrying over dumb things is in my DNA, trust me, it's in my DNA. And that's true for every one of us. There are traits. I swear there are times I'm in the car and I turn to Tommy and I call him by his mother's name just to tick him off. Because I know as sure as I'm alive that I'm looking right square at his mother's ghost as I speak to him right then. Because I can just see his mother doing what he's doing or saying what he's saying. I can just hear her talking through him. And I know that's where he got that trait from. Do you follow what I'm saying? We all have traits. We all have personality traits. We all have things built into our DNA that sometimes are going to cause us to approach the Lord in ways that we really ought not to approach Him. And thank God, God understands. Aren't you glad today the Lord understands us? Yes, absolutely. And He'll step in, and He'll give us a miracle, and then as soon as that miracle's come, He'll, by the Holy Ghost, slap us up against the side of our head and say, All right, Demi, are you learning anything? Are you figuring this out yet? You don't need to come at me all fearful. You don't need to come at me in a panic. You don't need to come at me scared. You don't need to come at me with accusations. But just watch. A month or two will pass and we'll forget all about what the Lord did for us today. Am I telling the truth today? Uh-huh. I got news for you, a lot of Christians, the only miracles they ever see God perform are the miracles that are born of His grace and His mercy and His love. Because the only way they know how to approach God is fearfully, panicked, desperate. Am I telling the truth today? Yes, yes. It's the only way they know how to even come to God. But I'm here to tell you today, fear and unbelief are not welcome in the life of a child of God. People of God seldom step out in faith obeying the voice of the Lord because to do so would require that they step out of their comfort zone. <laughs> oh, no, 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 Lord. I'm okay, God, believing you for miracles so long as I can just sit right here where I'm comfortable. Don't ask me to do nothing that's going to make me feel the least bit uncomfortable. Don't ask me, Lord, to step out of my comfort zone. I've told the story before and I'll tell it again. When I came back to Texas as a teenager, I had come at the bidding of the Lord. The Lord spoke to me to come to Texas. I came... My mother followed several months later and decided she wanted to go back to Connecticut. I fought with her tooth and toenail. I said, you want to go back to Connecticut? You go back to Connecticut. You want to go back to my father? You go back to my, not my, not my heavenly father, my earthly father. I said, you want to go back to that man? You go back to him. But I'm staying right where I'm at because God called me to be here. I didn't come down here for you. I come down here for God. And therefore, I'm staying where I'm at. 
Well, she and I, I mean, the tension was growing, and it was getting worse and worse. And finally, one day, I went to Brother Gillum, and I said, Brother Gillum, let me tell you what's happening. And I told him what was going on between my mother and I. And Brother Gillum gave me, I believe to this day, that the Holy Ghost operated through him. One of the gifts of the Spirit is a word of wisdom. In a nutshell, let me tell you what a word of wisdom is. A word of wisdom is the perfect answer. Straight from God's mouth to your ear. And sometimes when we need wisdom and we can't find it for ourselves, the Lord will speak through somebody with a word of wisdom. He'll place that word in their spirit and they'll speak it. And honey, I got news for you. You're not hearing from Brother Gillum. You're not hearing from Pastor Charles. You're not hearing from that church member. You're hearing from the Lord. And Brother Gillum spoke a word of wisdom and he said to me, he said, Chuck, go back up north with your mother. He said, if God wants you back in Texas, He'll bring you back. But He'll do it in a way that there'll be no tension and no fighting and you won't have your mother up there and you down here not talking to each other and not having a relationship with you know, because you're mad at each other. He said, God operates in the realms of peace and God operates in the realms of harmony. As Brother Gillum spoke those words, the last thing in the world I wanted to do was go back to Connecticut. I knew what my father was. And I knew good and bloody well my father hadn't changed one of his stripes. And as Brother Gillum spoke those words, Tommy, I'm telling you, I felt the Holy Ghost come over me. I can't even describe it. This peace came over me. This peace. I, I, it was the most wonderful sensation I've ever had. And I knew that was the word of wisdom. God just spoke through Brother Gillum, so to speak, you know, gave him a word of wisdom for me. So I went back to my mother. I said, all right, Mother, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go with you. I said, but let me tell you, I said, I believe God called me to Texas. And if the Lord makes a way for me to come back, I'm going to come back. But I'm going to go with you so we can have peace and, and our relationship won't be torn and all. Long story short, I went back to Connecticut with my mother. I was there a total, I think it was about five or six weeks. While I was there, a man who hadn't been to my church since I was less than a year old, or about a year old, came to preach for the church I grew up in. Now, I'd already switched over to the Church of God by now, so I was going to a different church than the one I grew up in, in Connecticut. But... This man was coming to preach at the church I grew up in, and, and my mother grew up with this fella, and he had been off ministering for many, many years. Here I was now about 16, you know, going on 17, almost. And uh, Nori was coming to preach, and I said, oh, I want to hear Nori, because my mother talks about him all the time. She grew up with him, you know. I knew his family, because they were part of our church. So here I am. I go to hear Nori preach. And one Sunday, uh, after he, uh, he's preaching his sermon, and as he's preaching his sermon, he walks down the aisle past me, and he puts the microphone under his arm, and he swings around and plants his hands on my head. I didn't even know he was doing it, because I'm looking down at my Bible. I'm sitting in the second pew uh, back on the right-hand side where I always sit. I didn't see him doing this. He was kind of behind me, you know. He swung around, planted his hands, and man, that man began to prophesy. He began to prophesy about the nature of the ministry that God had called me to. He had begun to prophesy all kinds of things. There were three major points that he hit in that prophecy. Every one of those points were things that I had shared with my family over the years. The type of ministry I was going to have, the, the individual in Scripture that it would be modeled after, the whole nine yards. It's going to be a prophetic ministry. It was going to be a ministry like that of John the Baptist. And that God had called me since I was a child. 
these three things. And Norit hit every single one of those points. I mean, he didn't just hit it, honey. He rode it. He literally, I'm not kidding, he rode every point. He started out with, Before I formed thee in thy mother's womb, I called thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And I mean, he began quoting Jeremiah 1. I'd run around for years telling people, look what the Lord showed me. Look what the Lord showed me. Jeremiah 1, this is what God said. This is, he, he talked to me through this portion of Scripture. All of a sudden, I got a man prophesying over me, quoting that exact portion of Scripture word for word. When he gets done with that, the Lord says, I have called you. I've called you. i put my seal upon your head. I have ordained you to be a prophet. And he begins to go into how my ministry would be prophetic in nature. He began to talk about how God said, people are going to look at you and say you're crazy. People are going to look at you and say you're out of your mind. He said, but you're not out of your mind. You're saying what I've told you to say because you are going to speak what I put in your spirit to speak and you're not going to care nothing about the listener, about who's hearing you. You're not going to look at their faces and worry about whether or not they approve of what you have to say. If I put it in you to say it, you're going to say it. And then he goes on to say, just like John the Baptist, and he goes into this diatribe. But those are three points that I had covered with my family over the years. And this man prophesied over me, and he rode every one of them points all the way to the finish line. After the service, my mother and I go out to the car, and I'm going to tell you, you ain't never heard quiet as quiet as this. <laughs> Man, I mean, the birds weren't chirping. I mean, the, the, the crickets weren't making any noise. Everybody, everything, all my aunts, my uncles, my grandmother, they were all sitting there in that service. All of a sudden, there wasn't a word coming out of a one of them. We get to the car, we get in, and finally my mother finds the courage. I don't know, Mom, if you remember this or not. She looks at me and she says, you're going back to Texas if I've got to pay your way myself. <laughs> she knew at that point that when I said God called me to Texas, he meant that I meant God called me. That I wasn't telling myself to go, that God called me. Long story short, God provided a job for me. I made the money. I paid my bus ticket. I went back to Texas. By the time I got back to Texas, I had so little money in my pocket. I had my suitcase packed, a big old suitcase or two, and I had all of maybe like $50, $60 on me. I think that's all the money I had. I had nowhere to stay, nothing. Staying with my aunt was no longer an option. I, had no, I didn't know what I was going to do. All I knew is God called me to Texas, so I was going to go. See, I'm here to tell you, folks, God does great things when you come at Him in fear and when you come at Him in panic and when you come at Him in every kind of way but faith. But I'm going to tell you, He does greater things when you step outside your comfort zone. I knew God had spoken to the water and calmed the boat. Calmed the water from the boat, I should say. I was there when that miracle happened. And I was still in my comfort zone. See, I was on the boat. I was comfortable. I, was, I didn't have to do anything special for God to perform that miracle. But now I had Jesus on the water saying, come. I had the Lord talking to me and telling me to do something. And I wasn't too comfortable doing it because, first of all, Peter said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come out on the water and I'll walk on the water with you. Uh, Peter, what if it ain't him? <laughs> You're going to drown, son, because you said, Lord, if it's you. You had to know Peter knew it was him. Because Peter wasn't that stupid. He wasn't going to step out on the water not knowing for certain. But Peter understood a principle that every believer ought to understand. If you want to be guaranteed success, I don't care how hard the situation, I don't care how big a miracle you need. If you want to be guaranteed success, all you need to seek is the word from the Lord. 
Don't you dare step out and start doing something stupid until you've heard Jesus tell you to step out and do it. Because when the Lord tells you to do it, honey, you're going to be able to do it. If the Lord doesn't tell you to do it, you're going to fall into the water and drown. Hello now. Peter understood that. You remember at the wedding in Cana of Galilee when the wine had run out and Jesus' mother Mary came to him and said, Oh, don't you know the wine has run out? And he said, well, what do you want me to do about it? He said, well, then my hour is not yet come. Well, Mary knew something a lot of other people didn't know. <laughs> she said, all this boy has to do is open his mouth. And the minute he says something, you just got to do whatever he says. Greater things happen when you step outside your comfort zone. So I'll fill up these pots over here with water. Just fill them up with water. Uh, excuse me, Lord, we're out of wine. We're not out of water. we got plenty of water. We don't need any more water. Uh, fill up these, these things here with water. They look at Mary like, what, is this kid out of his mind? Mary looks at them and says, Whatsoever he Whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. Ha, <laughs> ha, ha! Mary knew. She already had it down. She knew the key to a miracle. Listen, the minute you hear something come out of his mouth, all you got to do is do it, honey. You don't have to question. You don't have to doubt. You don't have to be fearful. All you got to do is do it. They did what he said, and we know the story. They poured out wine where water had been. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. yes. Well, I want to tell you, Peter saw that miracle. He got that principle in his head. Mary said, whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. Um, Lord, if it's you, then bid me come out. See, I know the secret. All I gotta do is all I gotta do is hear a word from you, and I'll be guaranteed success. Lord said, one word. One word. Come. I told you that principle is as powerful as any principle you'll ever know in your life. All you need is a word from the Lord and you're guaranteed success. You don't need a speech from Jesus. You don't need a great big lengthy prayer or a great big lengthy command. All you need is a word from the Lord. And Jesus said, Peter started making his way over the side of that boat. Hallelujah. I just picture Pete, Peter in his mind thinking, Oh, I've seen the Lord do great things when he was on the boat with us. But I was comfortable there knowing he was on the boat. <laughs> now he's not on the boat. i got to step outside of my comfort zone if I'm going to experience this miracle. Yeah, but Peter, greater things happen outside our comfort zones. You see, to get outside of your comfort zone, you got to get past the panic. You got to get past the fear. You got to get past the terror. You got to get past the accusations against God. Hello now. And you got to step into the realms of faith. Peter said, All right, Lord, you know what? Up till now, Every miracle I've seen, every miracle I've participated in practically has been a miracle that occurred within my comfort zone. You fed the 5,000 before we pushed off the shore and started making this journey from one side to the other. I just saw you feed 5,000, but I didn't have to do one single thing that made me uncomfortable. Hello now. Was there anything about that miracle that the Lord asked of His disciples that made them uncomfortable, that made them have to step out of it? No. He said, this boy's got a lunch. So I'll tell you what, y'all start, start spreading that out amongst the crowd. I'm sure in their minds they thought, well, this is going <laughs> to be a short, short task. But then as they started breaking the bread and as they started 
taking the fish and putting it out, they notice, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This basket just keeps producing. This basket just, oh my Lord, it ain't stopping. It just keeps producing. But we don't know. Their expectations might have been, well, Lord, this will be the shortest lunch I've ever served because there ain't but a few loaves and a couple of fish here and there's thousands of people. If you want me to pass this out as far as I can pass it out, all right, but it ain't going to go far. They didn't have to get outside of their comfort zone for that miracle. But now Peter says, oh, I got a feeling that greater things happen when we step outside our comfort zone. See, in the comfort zone, great things happen. But outside our comfort zone, greater. Remember I said at the beginning of my message, remember, it says greater things happen outside our comfort zone. It's not that great things don't happen within your comfort zone, but honey, you want to see greater miracles? You want to see a greater manifestation of the power of God? You want God to reveal Himself to you in a greater way? Then step out of your comfort zone! Because as long as you're sitting on your spiritual sofa, as long as you're in your spiritual easy chair, uh, there is a limit as to what all you're going to see God do. And most Christians, that's where they live. Their spiritual easy chair. They ain't never going to step out of their comfort zone. I come back to Texas with 50 or $60 in my pocket. I spent about almost 40 of it at a motel in Haltom City the first night. Then I went to church that morning. Brother Gillum brings two couples who had recently gotten married to the front of the church and he stood one couple over here, one couple over here, he put an offering plate in front of each of them and he said, we're going to take an offering to help send these couples off on their new lives together, he said. Just come and hug their necks and whatever you can, just drop it in the offering plate in front of them and we're going to give that to them as a gift. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, never forget it as long as I live said, you've got, I think I had 28, if I remember correctly, I think I had like $28. A $20 bill, a $5 bill, and three singles, if I remember correctly. And the Lord said, you've got a five and three singles. I want you to put five in that offer plate. I want you to put the three singles in that offer plate. I sat there and I said, Lord, I'm in church this morning. I just got back to Texas yesterday as if God don't know my situation. So, Lord, I just got back yesterday. I've spent money at a motel. I don't even have enough money for one more night at a motel. I have no idea where I'm going to stay. I don't know what I'm going to do. I may starve to death because this money ain't going to feed me for long. And you're asking me to give away $8? So what did I do? I said... Greater things happen outside your comfort zone. I got up and I went up in that receiving line and I hugged their necks and I put a $5 bill in this offering plate. I put a $3 bill in that, $3 in that offering plate. I went back to my seat. I sat down and I wept like a baby. I was scared out of my mind. Was I comfortable doing what I just did? Not even close. God was asking me to step out on water. And water don't generally support the human body. I sit down there, the rest of the service continued, and I'm crying, I'm praying. I go to Brother Gillum after church, said, Brother Gillum, can I stay in the church and pray? I need to pray for a while. He said, if you don't mind, I'd just like to stay and pray between services. He said, okay, Chuck. And he showed me how to lock the building up if I left said, this is how you lock it up if you have to leave. And he showed me. And then he gave me a handshake. And it was what we call a Pentecostal handshake. He had his thumb down like this. And in between his thumb and his palm was some money. And he reached over and I shook his hand and I felt that. And I said, oh, no, no. He said, son, take it. He said, the Lord's trying to bless you. Just take it. So I took it. He said, now listen. Before church, now I know you need to pray. I know you want to pray. Before church, he said, I want you to go buy yourself something to eat with that money I just give you. I said, okay, Brother Gilbert. 
He leaves. I look. It was a five dollar bill and three singles. Exactly what I had given away. It was as if God said, um, just get out of your comfort zone and let me show you what I can do. Let me show you I'm paying attention. Let me show you. He didn't, Brother Gilman didn't give me a $10 bill. He didn't give me a $20 bill. He didn't give me a $5 bill. And listen, this was back in 1982 or 3. 3. Five dollars could buy you a lot at the Jack in the Box in 1983, okay? Some of y'all too young to remember, but I mean to tell you, you could almost buy a franchise for five dollars back then, okay? I turned around and I started walking to the altars at the front of the sanctuary so I could get down and pray, and here comes Joe Bruce. His mother and dad have been members of this church for years. I only know them from the few months I've been living in Texas. I saw them in church. I never had been in their house. I never had fellowshiped with them uh, in any way, shape, size, or form. Didn't know them from Jack the Ripper. And Joe Bruce comes into the church and said, uh, Brother Chuck, my mom wants you to come to dinner with us. We're buying. Now, Brother Gilman just gave me $8 to buy myself some. He said, my mother wants you to come. We're buying. I said, oh, Joe, thank you, man. But no, I'm, oh, hallelujah, I got to pray. I got to pray. Uh, tell her thank you, but I got to pray. So he leaves for a minute. After a few minutes, he comes back in. He said, um, Brother Chuck, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but my mother said she wants you to come on out here and we're going to take you to eat. And I said, oh, no, 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 I've got to pray. Trust me, I've got to pray. I said, oh, I've got a big thing going on right now, Joe, and I need God to move on it. I need to pray. So he leaves. After a minute, he comes in the third time. He said, Brother Chuck, my mother said that if you send me out here one more time and you're not with me, that she's coming in next. And you don't want to tangle with her. Now, Sister Bruce was a portly, let's say, lady. She was a sweet woman. I, they became like mother and dad to me, brother and sister Bruce. They were very precious people, very spiritual people. I said, all right. I guess I ain't going to win this argument. All right. So Brother Gillum showed me how to lock up the church. So I'm not going to get a word of prayer in. I lock up the church. I put the gate to and, you know, fasten it the way he showed me. I get in the car and Sister Bruce, we're driving to some restaurant. And Sister Bruce said, so Chuck, how long have, how long have you been back from Connecticut? I said, I just got back yesterday. She said, oh, we did too. She said, you know, every summer, Brother Bruce and Joe and Tammy and I, we go uh, traveling all over Oklahoma and uh, Arkansas and different states and Texas, and they had a children's ministry. And every summer they traveled, and they did kids' crusades and vacation Bible schools and stuff in churches of God all over the, the area. She said, we just got home yesterday ourselves. She said, so where are you staying now that you're back? Now, i got to tell you, you know, word gets around. Just about everybody knew my Aunt Dot was, you know, fed up with me and mad at me for all these crazy reasons, you know. Everybody knew how she was, you know. It's no secret, you know, how she is. Everybody knew it. So Sister Bruce said, so where are you staying at now that you're back? And I started to cry. Oh, I'm not sure. I, I really don't have anything set up yet. Mama. And she said, I do. said, you're going to stay with us. said, our house is small. We only have two bedrooms and one bath. She said, but we've got a Winnebago that we travel in every summer to do our kids' crusades. And that Winnebago is parked in our driveway. And it's all hooked up. We even hook up the water hose to it. We even hook up the electric to it. She said, uh, you're going to stay in the Winnebago. You've got a place to stay. Problem solved. All I did was step out of my comfort zone enough to give $8. God, by the end of the day, whoo, hallelujah, I didn't even have to pray. 
Reminds me of that story of the foolish person standing on the roof as the flood waters rise. Lord, help me, God. Lord, send me, send me help, Lord. I'm gonna drown. I'm gonna drown. And the guy comes along with a boat, and he's, Oh no, thank you. Said the God's gonna save me. And then the water gets higher, and another guy comes along in a boat, and he says, oh, don't worry about it. God's going to save me. After a while, the water's up to his neck. A helicopter comes by, throws him a line. He says, oh, don't worry about it. God's going to save me. Winds up dead, stands before the Lord, and said, Lord, I don't understand. I was praying, asking you to help me. Why didn't you help me? The Lord said, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. That was my experience with Joe coming in three times. Two boats and a helicopter. <laughs> But I'm trying to tell you, folks, greater things happen outside our comfort zones. If you're trying to live your Christian life and you don't ever want to step outside of your comfort zone, I got news for you, honey. You ain't never going to see the things I've seen. You ain't never going to experience the things I've experienced. God is never going to be as real to you as God is to me. And I can make that statement, and I'm not even the least bit worried about it. Any form of contradiction. Too many Christians running around and they wonder why their walk with God is so shaky. They wonder why they're on the verge of backsliding every other Monday. They wonder why they struggle and struggle to keep their faith intact. Oh, I'll tell you why. Because you have never given God an opportunity to do things that would lock your faith in so tight that the devil couldn't dislodge it with an atomic bomb. People come to me and say, oh, God ain't real. That religion just a bunch of bunk. And I look at them and I say, honey, you're talking to the wrong guy here. Oh, you're talking to the wrong guy here. I'm going to tell you something. God done so many things for me. I've seen the Lord do so many things. I can't even begin to tell you. If I were to start sharing it with you today, we wouldn't finish until six months from next Tuesday. God is as real to me as the notes on my face. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. He is as real to me as the notes on my face. Because many, 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 many times He has spoken to me and required me to step outside of my comfort zone. And I wasn't an idiot. I knew whatsoever He saith unto thee, do it. I knew if God spoke to me to do it, I'd better good and well do it. I did. And then I saw miracles after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. God has revealed Himself to me. But you know what? Greater things happen outside our comfort zones. Fear and unbelief are repulsive to the Lord. He's looking for people who can find the faith and the courage to step outside of their comfort zones and walk on the water with Him. Hallelujah! In Hebrews 11 and 6, the Word of God declares, But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Mm -hmm. Impossible! So i got news for you. If you're living your Christian life on your lazy chair and everything you do and the way you always do things is based on your comfort zone, i got a little news for you. You haven't pleased the Lord a day in your walk with Him. Yes, I said it. You haven't pleased God. Not in the least. Do you think it pleased the Lord when the disciples came to Him running and saying, Lord, don't you care that we perish? You think that fear pleased Him? You think that unbelief pleased Him? You think that panic pleased Him? Sure, He gave them a miracle anyway. That's just because we serve a kind and loving God. But do you think they pleased Him? No, they didn't. Because in the next breath, He rebuked them for not having any faith. Am I telling the truth? Uh-huh. Even after Peter began to lose focus and he started to fall into the water and the Lord had to reach down and grab him by the hand, they weren't even back on the boat yet and the Lord was rebuking him. Got news for you, honey. Unbelief and fear and panic don't please God. 
never has and never will. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Well, Pastor, what are you telling me? What I'm telling you is, somewhere in your walk with God, you better learn to step outside of your comfort zone. Somewhere in your walk with God, you would better realize that if you're going to demonstrate faith, if you're going to act in faith and seek God do greater things, you're going to have to get past your comfort zone. Revelation 21 and 8. Listen. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Woo. Look at the company that God puts the fearful and the unbelieving in. Do you know how God sees fearful and unbelieving? He sees them like the same way He sees murderers. The same way He sees idolatry. Am I telling the truth? The same way He sees whoremongers. The same way that He sees the abominable. You see, fear and unbelief repulse God. Those are not things that make the Lord happy. He gives you miracles when you're panicked. He gives you miracles when you're fearful. He's a loving and gracious God, but He expects you to grow up and get some spiritual stamina and learn to trust Him and learn to believe Him. Listen, if He comes through enough for you when you're panicked and unbelieving, then how much more can you trust Him and believe Him and know that He's going to come through for you? I mean, come on, folks. Two and two equals four. Right. This isn't hard to figure out. But God wants us to mature. He wants us to grow. He wants us to finally get to that place in our lives where we are coming to Him in faith, we are stepping out in response to His Word so that we can see greater things. Jesus said, Greater things shall they do that come after Me because I go unto the Father. He said that believers would do greater things than He did. Why? That's <laughs> simple. It's very simple. Here, people could just sit back in their comfort chair and let the Lord do stuff. But now, He's given us this. He's given us His Word. He's given us a stack of promises two and a half inches high. He's given us things we can walk up to Him in prayer and say, Lord, You said, You promised, You said, hello now. And we can go to God and we can claim the promise of His Word and we can go to the Lord and say, Lord, You spoke and because You spoke, I'm responding to what You said. Hello now. I'm stepping outside of my comfort zone. Lord, You said, Give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. And because You said that, I'm going to go outside of my comfort zone and I'm going to be a giver. Hello now. Anybody who knows me even the slightest bit, I, 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 you know, I don't say this to brag, but I'm telling you, I'm, I don't have any problem saying it. If you know me at all, you know I'm a giver. I, I make Tommy so mad sometimes. I'll get something, I'll barely have it in the house. It's taking up room in the entryway in the box because UBS brought it. And then somebody comes along and they can use it more than I do. So I say, well, then why don't you take it? Tommy said, what are you nuts? You just got that. Why in the world? Because I'm a giver. I'm going to tell you something, honey. I operate outside of my comfort zone every day, all day, all day. I operate outside of my comfort zone all the time. Because I know what God has said. And I'm going to act upon what God has said whether I'm comfortable doing it or not. Because I know that greater things happen outside of my comfort zone. 
I can't just sit where I'm comfortable all the time. I can't sit where it always feels good and I feel secure and happy doing it. There are times when I've got to go outside of my comfort zone and I've got to do things that I'm not quite so crazy about doing. I had a truck. I wanted to drive Uber and Lyft. Every job I tried to get, I couldn't get because they wanted me to work Sundays and Wednesdays and what have you. And I couldn't find a regular job. I finally found Uber online and I looked at it. I said, hey, I can do that. I signed up to drive for Uber and found out my truck, my Ford Explorer, was one year too old. One year too old for their requirements. So I had to go buy me a new truck. A new vehicle, I should say. I bought the minivan. I knew there was a guy in the church that really could use the vehicle. I paid the down payment on this truck. I paid the insurance, the tax, I mean, and the license. I've been making payments for two and a half years. I only owed six months payments on it. So I went to this fellow and I said, listen, uh, would you like this truck? All you got to do is make the last six months payment on it. Did I ask Tommy to make one nickel off of that deal? No. Did I ask for any down payment? No. Did I ask for anything additional? No. All I wanted was to bless this person. Listen, when I've needed a vehicle, it would have been a wonderful blessing to me if somebody come up to me and said, Hey, all, that, all you got to do is pay $300 a month for six months and this is yours. You don't have to pay a down payment. I've done take care of that. You don't have to pay two and a half years worth of payments. I've already done that. You know, you know what I'm saying? And I did that. Now, I could have used that truck to trade it in toward my van, and it would have saved me money on my van. But why would I do that when I've got somebody in the church who needs a vehicle, and, and I can do this for them? Do you follow what I'm saying? Uh-huh. I'm going to tell you, you learn to live outside of your comfort zone, and you're going to see God blessing you till you can't even stand it. In Mark chapter 9, I'm trying to close up today. We read the story of a man who came to Jesus and said, Hey, I brought my child to your disciples to have this spirit cast out of them, and they were unsuccessful. Could you do something for me? I'm trying to shorten the story up so I can be done on time today. Verse 23, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Let me find the right verse here now. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I'm going to tell you something. Everybody under the sound of my voice today, every child of God in this country, in this state, in the world, should be praying this prayer on a regular basis. Lord, I have faith. Lord, I know you can do things. Lord, I, I do trust you, but at the same time, I know that there are times that my faith fails. I know there are times that I don't trust you like I should. I know there are times, Lord, when you ask me to do something, I cannot find the courage to do it because I'm never, never quite comfortable stepping out of my comfort zone. Every one of us ought to be praying, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Because I know fear and unbelief are not pleasing to you. And I know the only thing that is pleasing to you is faith. And I know that faith requires that we step outside of our comfort zone.